Hello and welcome to The Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. We are your front row seat to the best thriller writers in the world. Whether it's books, movies, or TV, we're here for you. And on today's 121st episode, a repeat performance by none other than the gray man himself, Mark Rainey. And his latest book is called Burner. And it sizzles, baby. It sizzles. <laughs> All right, enough about that. Let's get on into the green room where Mark is standing by right here on the Thriller Zone. So how are things? They're going well. How about you? Just, just living the dream, dude. Live in the dream. <laughs> Dream's not as big as yours, but I'm living what I can. Uh, same. I'm just trying to make it through the day. Well, welcome back for a three-peat. I guess this is... Is it three? Yeah. It is three. It's hard to believe it was what, uh, CR6 was the last one. Ar Armored was the last one. CR6 yeah. was the one before mm -hmm. that. So that's like June and September, something like that. Yeah. Dude, you have been, uh, I can't even imagine what your life is like. Well, it's super busy, but I, you know, the, right now my struggle is to get my words written for next year's book. My, I always tell myself, it's like, I'm the only one right now that cares about next year's <laughs> book because there's all the, uh, you know, things going on with this year's book, which is great, which is what you want to happen. But at the same time, I'm like, I've got to keep, uh, I've got to keep myself honest and uh, protect next year's, uh, release so that when we come around here next year, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not awkward for everybody that I either don't have a book or, <laughs> or don't have a book that I, that I'm happy about. So, yeah. Um, that's the thing that keeps me busiest, like, uh, you know, interviews or family stuff or uh, travel obligations or whatever. It, it's all one thing, but it's like, if I can get, get a few hours away to write, even if it's 45 minutes at a time, um, then I feel like I've got a handle <laughs> on life in general. You know, you brought up an interesting point. I was talking to someone just this past weekend. Uh, I won't mention his name in case he doesn't want that to be public knowledge, but he, he was talking about something you just referred to. He's working on this book. He, he puts the book out. You put all that energy into it. And then um, it, it's, it's gaining its own momentum, but you're starting on the next thing. So it could be months and months and months later. And he made the comment of like, that book? Oh, geez, I, I'm just kind of glad to be done with that because that seems so far away. Yeah. And I walked away and I was telling Tammy about this and I'm like, that must be really frustrating to... Or a challenging thought. So you put all this energy and you and you think, here it is, ready to go. And it might be months and months later before you're really spending a lot of time talking about it. Absolutely. And, and I've run into that a million times where I am so, like so focused on something that I'm writing. And then by the time it comes out, uh, as it like right now, I'm 40 something thousand words into the next book. And so I'm doing research on totally different things, totally different places. There's different characters. So it's always the first half dozen interviews are, are always really kind of like halting and confused. I've had, I've literally been in interviews and they'll be like, so tell me about, and they'll name, they'll throw some name out and I'll be like, I remember that name that, that <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't remember who they were, but because it's, it's just, you know, you sort of need to keep putting them out. And I've even been like invited to come speak at the, like the Lithuanian embassy about Russia's involvement in you know, the Baltics or something because of something I'd written in a Clancy book that came out the year before. And I'm, and I'm thinking a year ago, I knew enough about it to write a book. Uh, now I know less about it and things have probably changed. It's like, I could, I could refer you to some real experts if you need <laughs> real experts. I, I would just be there for show. And, and most of the information <laughs> that I have <laughs> made it to the page probably. That begs the question, do you ever find yourself having to keep a little, uh, you know, crib notes off to the side only because of the volume? And you're one of the guys, by the way, we're going to get to this beautiful book burner in a second. 500 pages seems to be about your norm. So, mm -hmm. and you, and it's chock full of characters. So to the same point, I'm thinking if I, if I'm trying to keep track of not only the thread of the idea, but all the characters, and I'm now yeah. one year later. Do you have to kind of keep, which would be you nothing mean, wrong with that. You mean like for interviews? Yeah. Stand by. <laughs> 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 I, so far, I haven't had to refer to it, but uh, it's, you know, the day will come. No, it's literally like, uh, you know, I, 
I forget the names of some secondary characters and somebody, cause I, like I said, I've, I've been burned before where I've had to have somebody kind of give me hints about who this character is they're asking about. And then you remember, I mean, I think there's probably 50 characters in a book on average. Some of them are only in one chapter, obviously that sure. you, you don't have 50 main characters, but you never know what people are going to ask you. And you know, there's, they'll be like, are we ever going to see Alex again in another book? And, and I'm like, yeah. Alex, uh, yeah. <laughs> The other thing that happens, which is funny, is I get emails from fans all the time who are reading some other some book in the series. Sure. And I think they they feel like I'm sitting there with them looking over their shoulder because I'll, I'll get an email. It's like, dude, chapter 43. What were you thinking? Yeah. You know, and I just look at the email and just, you know, file it. You know, I'm, I'm like, I, I don't know what book you're talking about. Yeah. I, I, uh, authors don't normally know by chapter. You know, like if somebody goes like, I can't believe that the way things changed in chapter seven. I'm like, yeah. Just, just tell me, you know, I remember the story, but I don't remember what chapter it is. You know, that's probably 60, 70 pages in. So I can sort of maybe put something together if I really <laughs> thought about it. But yeah, it's funny. You're, it's, it's always a scramble. I'll probably do a hundred interviews for this, uh, for this book. And I'm probably about 10 in now. So this is, this is me smooth, sadly. <laughs> you should have seen, you should have seen me two weeks ago. <laughs> All right. Here's the good news. I, I, I consider us friends because we've hung out enough to be called friends. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to throw anything at you that you're not expecting. <laughs> and we're really just here always. It, to me, it's always about just checking in, having fun. And yes, of course, we're going to talk about Burner. We're going to talk about, we'll probably refer to some old books, but we're definitely going to be talking about The Gray Man. But, you know, I have been in this business a long time, as you have as well. And I know that when you hit those junkets and you have to talk nonstop about the same topic over and over and over, and you're doing it a hundred times you just referenced, it, it's, it's tough. And I think I, I talked to some of my author friends and they think, and this is always so funny to me, they think, I'll write the book, I'll pass it off, it'll get done, I'll be on my way, I collect my check and do another one. I'm like, yeah, dude, that's that's... 30% of it may be right. 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 Yeah. It's, it's just a process to where, you know, you go out, I mean, you know, a huge percentage of my time I'm sitting there by myself, uh, you know, typing and sure. working on my book or, or reading or, or something like that. But then when you go out on, on these things, like, like you said, there's some days where you do these, uh, radio satellite tours where you're just on the phone and they will just patch you in with different radio stations around the country. Or sure. And, it, and it, it'll go on for seven, eight hours. Yeah. I've done 30, 30 in a row. And some a lot of these segments are like five minutes long. And you start telling a story. And then I, you know, I'm telling a story. And I go like, all right, I just told this story two minutes ago. I hope it wasn't to the same guy. <laughs> I, hope, I hope we've changed out interviews because it, it really does get mind numbing. And the, the other funny thing that happens to me is a lot of, a lot of people normal, you know, totally normally at some radio station somewhere, they just have a little press sheet about me and my book and that's all they know. So they sort they're sort of going down the questions, you know, like the generating questions from the information in sure. front of them. So it, it's, it's always kind of the same. And, you know, after about five hours of this, you're, you're, engage with the people, but you're half asleep because yeah. you, you know what's coming next or whatever. Yeah. And then somebody will say like, so why did you change from the first person to the, th you know, like <laughs> they actually read the book and it, instead of like being like impressed with them, you're like, oh, what's this guy doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is a, it's not a curveball, but it, it, like, it feels like a curveball, you know, and, and you're going like, oh crap, I better wake up. Um, yeah. This guy's actually asking me a question. That's not, you know, one of the eight that I've been asked all day. Well, it's funny because I'm going to pull this up and folks, uh, when he was, Mark was referencing earlier, he held up two clipboards with notes. Um, <laughs> usually when you get a book uh, like burner you'll get a uh, a press release from you know this is from penguin random house and it'll it'll be accolades it'll be a, a synopsis and accolades and so forth and then uh and and mark i don't remember this happening most recently but then you'll get a conversation with and it'll ask you these bullet point questions i've never seen that Honestly, I, I, that doesn't, that's not something they'll even send to me. So, all right. Okay. Well, I try to never, yeah. ever use these because I feel like they're the quintessential, where do you get your ideas, Mark? Yeah. 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 However, there is one in here, as you'll see, I circled it, that, that mm -hmm. I am going to use only because I'm like, okay, well, that's it. not that they're not good. All good. Whoever put it together, you're fabulous. Yeah. yeah. But, but one of them got my attention. So we'll get to that anyway. Um, <laughs> 
I did want to ask, how was your Super Bowl? Was it was it you and the family, and and did your team win? So I didn't have a dog in the hunt until yeah. about kickoff when a, I found out a friend of mine was a personal trainer to one of the kids who's now on on the um, now playing for um, Philadelphia. So. Um, and suddenly it's like, wow, I have a personal connection to this. Um, right. And there's actually two players from my university that, that played for Philadelphia. So I guess in that regard, I was for Philly, but um, I'm not a huge football fan, but Pat Mahomes is just like so awesome and so cool. And he, he's been a lot of fun to watch the last few years. So we had, we had some friends over, not a big group, maybe like 12 people, including four or five kids. Yeah. And, uh, and we sat there and watched the whole game and had a, had a great time. Uh, watching it um, until like the last minute, like it felt like it, the excitement fizzled out there at the end. But that's that happens sometimes. Yeah, um, Mahomes is just to take ten seconds on it. He is he's a marvel to watch. I mean, he really is. He really is. He can pull things out of his back pocket that you like. Mm-hmm. How did you even think about that? At yeah. this and his second? offensive line was giving him like fifteen seconds to make decisions at some point. Yeah, like his they were doing great. There was one time I was going like. I might have been able to find a receiver with the amount of time that he he just had there. Not every play, obviously. Yeah. Well, good. And the wife and kids are good. Yes, everybody's. Yeah, everybody's great. Nice. Everybody's great. Yeah. All right. I think the last we spoke, I don't recall if the Gray Man, starring Ryan Gosling on Netflix, had actually. I think it had. I think it was going to drop right after our conversation. Probably, yeah. Not really that important, but man, Anthony and Joe Russo just hit it out of the friggin' park. Yeah, I, I I enjoyed it. I thought it was good, and the places where it was similar to the book were exciting, and the places where it was different from the book also makes me happy because then I would think people should read the book because the book has a lot of differences, and I was able to be a little grittier and uh, you know more depth because I'm writing on the page. They were be able to be more visceral and and visual and uh you know whatever other adjectives because it's it's a completely different medium but sure. um it was a great commercial for the for the book and we've sold a bunch of books since then good and i i had a great time watching it every time i've seen it <laughs> i told my wife tammy i said you know you had said something that is one of my favorite quotes and i you will often hear an author boo-hoo the fact that their adaptation didn't get it exactly like the book and i'm like yeah. mark mark says it best hey i wrote this story for the book you wrote that story for the screen they're both yeah. great stories your interpretation is yours and yeah. i always thought that's so healthy of you mark yeah yeah i think that's the only way you can really look at it and i have some fans who are well-meaning and they're you know i'm lucky to have them as fans that aren't happy with the movie because Donald Fitzroy is British and there are things that were changed kind of arbitrarily in their opinions. But I'm also, you know, always trying to explain to them. It, it, it's just, you know, the directors are creative people too, and they're going to, they're going to put their, their mark on it. And, and that's what it is. I, I talked to one guy right before the movie came out and he was just talking about like all the details of the book and they better get this right. And they better get that right. <laughs> And I was just like, stick with the book. It's safe for you there. <laughs> I really think, I really think, you know, I can, you can only be let down because there, there are changes and, you know, something that happened in uh, Budapest happens in Prague or whatever. And, and that uh, is going to upset people. I, I, I have fans that are mad at me because some of my timelines in my book don't actually measure up because, you know, my first gray man book came out when my hero was 37 and he's not 51 now. And, and that makes some people mad, you know, it's uh, cause I'm just sort of writing to, for a certain, you know, type of character and I'm not aging him, uh, which some authors do. Daniel Silva is one of the best uh, thriller authors in the world. And he, he's aged his character and I totally respect that, but that's, I'm just doing something different. Um, mine's more like James Bond or somebody that, sure. that, that doesn't age. And so there are people that um, can't get past that. And, I get it, you know, I, I kind of get it, you know, but, but that's what they want. But everybody's different. I, I find that so hilarious. I'm like, just enjoy the ride for what the ride is. Uh, yeah. Whether you, and, and the thing I like about the book is, and you've mentioned this before, of course it makes sense. 
I can get inside Court's head in the book. I can I can see how he's feeling and thinking, yeah. and he's second guessing some of the foibles that he's been through, and he's right. negotiating what his next move is. You can't cram 500 pages of all that great detail into a 120 page screenplay. Exactly, you can't. I tried to write a screenplay once and learned that for myself. I was about 180 pages into it, thinking I was maybe at halfway through, and I was like, "All right, screenwriting is not for me. I'm the guy that writes." 700 page Clancy novels. So I uh, better stick with what I know. But, uh, you know, I will say that Ryan Gosling represented the character so perfectly well. Mm. I mean, with with little dialogue, which he has a there in the first Gray Man novel, there's not a ton of dialogue from from the hero. He, it, it's uh, it all takes place in about a three day period. And it's it's a lot of action. But um, I just thought Gosling was so perfect in that role. And anybody who says you know, I've had people go like, yeah, but he's Ken in, in the Barbie movie. And I'm like, <laughs> well, what I've learned, and I explain this to them kind of patronizingly, it's like, well, what I've learned is what he is, he's this thing called an actor. And so yes. what they do is they pretend to be different people. So he can pretend to be somebody when he's not making this movie. He doesn't have to pretend to be that character for the rest of his life. And, um, you know, sometimes you have to walk people through this a little bit and go like, books and movies are just two different things. Yeah. And, you know, don't see the movie if, if it's going to upset you. This is where I can hear my late grandmother go, bless his heart. He's just, he's just not that smart. Maybe he's dropped on his head as a child. Yeah, it, but, but, you know, <laughs> karma comes back around, though, because I always think about what I thought about authors. If, if an author made a mistake or if an author did something that I disagreed, you know, this was before I was an author. And, you know, sure. I'd read something and I'd be like, well, I, that care that that line of dialogue doesn't really make sense, you know. And I would get so fired up about it. It was pre-internet, thank God. Yeah. So uh, what happens to me now is, I, you know, like, there's people that will say things, and sometimes they're right, but sometimes they're wrong, and they will be like, "Oh my God!" They'll they'll email me and they'll go like, "I can't believe that you you said that a handgun can fire a bullet <laughs> at supersonic speeds. It's the most idiotic thing." And I email them back when I do email them back, and I'm like would have taken you a lot less time to Google that than it would to look up my <laughs> email address off my website and send the author a message because I'm, I'm embarrassed for you right now. Yeah, yeah, handgun bullets go, can go supersonic. Yeah. <laughs> or, or whatever, you know, it's just sort of like, all right, you came straight to the author on this. Um, yeah. Maybe you could have, like, looked into that yourself just to double check. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, Mark, maybe some people just have too much time on their hands yeah. Uh, and or they don't have a life. Yeah. Well, you know, again, <laughs> karma comes back because I think of all the things that I'm real persnickety about. Yeah. And I go like, this is just me, you know, reaping what I sowed because for a long time I would I would pick things apart. You know, I, I watched the movie Lethal Weapon and I'm like, yeah, Mel Gibson's closing his eyes when he pulls the trigger, uh, when he fires his Beretta. It's like, yeah, it's not how you do it. Yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then, you know, yeah. who am I? You know? Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, some people just, uh, you know, I, I think um, I also find, and I, and I was talking to someone recently, they're talking about uh, mistakes in a book. And it could be, you could forget a period, it could be a transposed letter or something. And I think it's interesting. I don't care how many times you read and reread a book and then have someone else reread it for you and then have a, an editor reread it. And 99 times out of 100, I've been told, there's one little thing somewhere. And for those people yeah. who will drop a note and go, by the way, on page 74, third paragraph, second sentence, you misspelled that word. Yeah. And I'm I, like, I, I get a lot of that. And I always, you know, my kind of rote answer is, you know, it's a 170,000 word book. There's probably five words I'd like to have back another, you know, another crack <laughs> at. I don't know what percentage of correctness, uh, you know, five out of 170,000 is, but I'm just going to have to be ha happy enough with that. And that, that doesn't mean that you're off the hook for the mistakes, but basically what happens is you write, you write something and then the scene looks a certain way to you. And every time you read the, read it, when you're editing it, it's, you just miss stuff because you're, you're visualizing what you're writing and saying, okay, is this the way I want the narrative to go, blah, blah, blah. And you're not sitting there every time you're looking at the guy on the A-10 punched the afterburner and there is no afterburner on A-10. It's like, you're not like, every time you read that word, you're not checking that stuff. You're, you're just going like, okay, yeah, I wrote that. It must be right. And, um, you know, you, you make hundreds of corrections every time you edit it and the copy editors make mistakes. And I've had people say, well, you know, your copy editor should have caught that. And it's like, 
Well, maybe if I gave them a hundred things to fix instead of a thousand, they would have caught it. But, right, right. I, but I make, you know, I make enough mistakes on my own. So I, you know, I, I have complete ownership of that. And there's, there's errors in, in the first gray man book, which came out in 2009. And I will get emails about it to this day. And, you know, the book's been out for 14, 14 years now, almost. And um, I'll get emails about it to this day. And, you know, I don't even really respond. It's they're, yeah. they're usually, People usually aren't mean. Every now and then somebody is like, uh, since you got this one error with firearms, firearms people are the worst. And I'm yeah. a firearms person, so I can say that. You know, you got this one error with this firearm. You, you, you gave 20 details about this firearm, but you got the... Um, you know, the muzzle velocity wrong by five feet a sec second. And it's kind of like, they're basically like, you West Coast liberals hate guns and don't know anything about them. And I'm like, <laughs> wow, I have him, you know, like I have him using this pretty, you know, sophisticated styre or whatever pistol with, you know, this, these tritium sites. And you know, I have all these details and right. I know nothing about guns because there, there's some detail I didn't get right. right. But everybody is, is an expert on certain things and then there's things they don't know about. So I will have... Uh, you know, uh, a lady who knows a whole lot about horses in one of my books, Courts on a Horse. And I said that the horse whinnied and she emailed me angrily that the horse would have neighed and not whinnied. Yeah. And I need, to, I need to do research, you know, and that sort of stuff. And, and you're thinking, yeah, that horse was in there for like one page. Right. And uh, I didn't basically go to equestrian school. You know, it's like <laughs> these books aren't coming out on that kind of a schedule where I can basically look at each word. I, I had a lady that was an expert on thermodynamics sent me this message about something. Oh, it was about the, uh, I, I had a character, not to belabor this, but it's just kind of sure. funny. Um, yeah. a, a character was very cold and they were sitting at a bus stop and the cold uh, frozen cement, this is in Sweden, uh, got into their feet and it, it pushed the cold up through their legs or something like that. And uh -huh. the lady emailed me, back, you know, emailed me and she said, listen, I'm an expert in thermodynamics. And cold is the absence of heat. Cold doesn't move or grow or blah, blah, blah. And I emailed her back and I said, all right, thanks for that. I promise I won't say that again. If you promise, you will email every time, you will email every writer that ever mentions the word sunrise because the sun does not rise. So I need you to uh, you know, go ahead and clarify that every time you read that in a book. Promise me you'll do that and I won't use this again. She did not reply. I was going to um, say you did not hear back from her. Back, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I made my point. I don't. I don't really engage like that, like I used to. Uh, I used to get so sort of like bent out of shape, but now it's just kind of funny. And this is all in good, clean fun. I mean, you yeah, know, of course. I, yeah, I'm so lucky to have these people. And and they, you know, if if they don't like one word out of 160 thousand words, I'm you know I, I've done my job. They've done their job by enjoying the rest of it. You know, everybody wins. Yeah, you know, I was thinking when I was reading this book, which is such a oh, I, it. I, I I try not to use this phrase as my favorite, but I think maybe this one was my favorite of all years so far. Okay. I don't know why. Maybe right. it's because it's so new. Yeah. Um. I don't know. It just it resonated with me. Anyway, I love the idea. Referring back to the thing that we will never say, which is where do you get your ideas? But I right. thought to myself, I love those moments, and this will happen when I'm walking down at the beach. Um, when you come up with a completely random thought has nothing to do with anything, you're not even maybe thinking about your next book, but the idea is so random and so unique that you tuck it away and you go, that can make an interesting scene. And then before you know it, it's woven its way into perhaps not only the story, but maybe in an entire chapter or maybe a pivotal point of the whole story. Do you ever have that happen? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And I, I keep little notes on my phone on a little note app uh, to try and jog my memory when it, when it does come in later. I have all these little gray man ideas that have never made it into books yet, but I, I want to. I have ideas about, you know, his early early life and his family and stuff like that, that um, it's, it's there's never really been a place that I thought was right to integrate it into a story because it would it wouldn't have been part of the narrative of that story. And I like to keep things moving, but um, there's so many little things that you write down. And a lot of times, again, like you said, it's not like I'm sitting there trying to think of what's going on in the uh -huh. next Gray Man novel. It, it's, I'm just writing something that, you know, I'm just thinking about a thing about human psychology or a thing about, you know, something going on in world affairs. And I think, well, wouldn't that be interesting if X, Y, Z, so I do take those notes all the time. I do draw from them some. 
Um, I'm a disorganized note taker. I'm a, <laughs> I'm an a <laughs> avid note taker, but pretty disorganized about it. So I've probably uh, missed the boat on some opportunities because I have so many notes with things like that. Well, there's two cool things I like to throw at you, and I'm sure you've already thought about them, but I'm going to throw them at you anyway. One of them is my favorite is like, because I have such bad handwriting or so sloppy handwriting, it mm -hmm. just trails off so fast because yeah. of exhaustion that I use this app called... Um, a sound. I think it's it's called voice memos. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I can be walking, I'll just go hit one button, boom. Oh, I've got this idea, blah, blah, blah. And the reason I like it, Mark, is because I will state the comment, the, the idea, and then I'll give it a little bit of reference. I was walking today and it was a particular kind of temperature or whatever, and this gave me the thought so that it kind of fills it out because I yeah. can't always read my handwriting. Yeah, and yeah. then I just hit a button and it sends it to an email straight to my email box. So later oh, when I go, uh, and then I just collect them and I stick them in a program like Evernote and then they're all yeah. stacked there. So. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll record right into Evernote sometimes. Usually I just jot down a few words, but, um, but I, sometimes I will on on the notes in Evernote I'll just I'll just record. Awesome. Look at all the stuff we're learning today. <laughs> well, we're going to take a very short break and when we come back we're going to be talking about this fabulous book burner in case you haven't heard of it yet. Uh I'm with Mark Graney. It's the Thriller Zone. Stay with us. And now back to the show. And welcome back to what I'm calling chapter 2 of the Thriller Zone. I'm with Mark Graney. Uh, he is back for a repeat performance. Now um this is number 3 trifecta it's old home week here at the tz hi mark hey there this book right here i, I want to jump right into something there is um and i love this i i tell people sometimes i don't read a great i often don't read a great deal of the detail because i just want to be surprised but the top part of this the thing that what i call the attention grabber i love inside flap here court gentry is sent on a mission by a person he doesn't trust to snatch a target he can't stand from the clutches of Russian assassins he can't defeat. And those are the upsides of the job. <laughs> Bam! <laughs> Rock solid. I think my editor writes those. I like that. That's really good. So good. Um, it's, you know, it, once again, Mark, you've, you've done that thing that we all, this is why we come to you for entertainment. This is why we drop the twenty nine ninety five or whatever it is, because you give it all to us. You give us, you got the action, you got the tools of the trade, but you better get the bullets right, mister. Uh, <laughs> you got the love story, which is always neat, especially when you're up in all this anxiety. You got international intrigue and, and perhaps my very favorite and maybe this is why it's so this one's so grabbed me it's that last minute rip from the headlines uh topics especially as it pertains to russia and the latest war in ukraine um so tell us about that and i mean it's literally as i'm reading i'm like this is like this stuff was happening yesterday and this book is now talking about it yeah that, that was a dicey aspect of of this project i started the book uh Really, I started thinking about the book before, and it was going to involve Russian money laundering um, through a, a bank in Switzerland. Um, and that's pretty much all I had. And the invasion kicked off in on February 24th, or the the, the Russian invasion began in 2014. But the, 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 the stage that we're in now kicked off February 24th of last year, 2022. And I immediately started tooling the book towards that. And um, there's a a banker in Switzerland who's actually Ukrainian who has lost some family members. And he finds out uh, through certain different ways that his bank is is laundering money for Russian, not just for Russia, but for Russian foreign intelligence. And he steals some information. And the gray man is trying to get it for the CIA. He's kind of working on a contract basis with the CIA. So as I was writing this book last spring and summer, even though not one page of Burner takes place inside Ukraine or involves the war, there's no you know tanks or troop movements, you, you had to sort of prognosticate a little bit of where we would be in February of 2023 when the book came out because, you know, it, the, the book would feel really wrong if something, you know, if, if, if it turned out differently. Right. Um, 
and and I think I got it pretty close as far as you know. Russia has a lot of territory in the east. Um, there are those in the west who are you know tiring of the war or who are propagandists for the Kremlin uh, for whatever reason. In this book, it's bribery and other sort of influence operations, and um, and you see that stuff all the time. I was too pessimistic about the West's resolve, I think, and I was also too pessimistic about the effects that the winter would have on European, you know, gas and oil. And uh, that turned out better than, than I could have hoped. And I'm happy to be wrong in those areas. Yeah. But, you know, in this book, there's a peace treaty that members of the West want signed that's sort of going to forgive and forget a lot of what Russia's done and, and at the expense of Ukrainian territory and lives. And, and it's a very cynical peace treaty that, that my hero court is trying to, get uh, stopped by proving that some of the people who are going to sign the treaty are these people taking bribes for Russia. So it was, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an espionage story. doesn't involve the war directly, but the, everything that's going on in the war is, is portrayed in there. And, and my emotions about what's going on really influenced this book and made this book a lot more, you know, of a passion project for me um, because I, I do spend all day, every day, watching, uh, you know, what's going on over there. It is so uh, disturbing and so uh, horrifying. And and what I wanted to say is that you you would have sworn it was right along the sidelines of the story. And it didn't detract, distract um, one bit. I didn't sit there and go, oh, well, that hasn't happened or is happening or that it happened a different way. Yeah. And uh, so I think, you know, once again, the significance is that you're you're on the mark, uh, as always. Thanks. And uh, yeah, just big congratulations. I know Thank and you. I know this is a nebulous comment, but I want to know this. And it's 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 so, it sounds kind of stupid, but I'm rolling with it. What do you think is your secret to always keeping your work so fresh and timeless because there are some writers who you can kind of tell when they've just gotten tired and I can't even, I, I'm, I'm not thinking of anyone specific and I'm not thinking of any specific attribute, but you can just yeah. kind of get that feeling of like, wow, have I, haven't they told this story already? And haven't that yeah. kind of, so what's that secret to keeping it fresh? Do you think? <sighs> If there was a secret, I wish I knew it. It, it, it. It's harder every book to do something you haven't done before. Um, but it's also the thing that I'm, you know, that's the brass ring that I'm, I'm reaching for with each book. So I don't necessarily even find the heart and soul of the story until a few months into writing it. Like I'll come up with a plot and I'll be like, all right, I don't, I'm not exactly sure how this is going to be different from you know, a typical gray man book. And I don't want it to be a template. I don't, I want it to be something different. And I've done dramatic things at times. Like, uh, this book mission critical was more about Zoya and less about court. And this book one minute out was, uh, you were in court's first person perspective, uh, for the one time, you know, so I've done mm -hmm. dramatic things. Um, this one is more of a pure espionage novel than a lot of them are. And, um, the relationship between court and Zoya and, the introduction of some new characters, I think, kept it fresh in my head. But also, you know, every time I write a scene, uh, be it an action scene or, or something, I have to think, have I done, you know, Burner's my 23rd book. <laughs> I'm like, have, have I done this before or anything too like this before? And um, there, will be, there will come a time where that <laughs> is no longer possible. And hopefully I will hang up my hat or, you know, just leave it on for the next generation. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to phone it in. I don't want to be one of these guys that puts a book out every June and it could be like a book that they wrote in 1985. They don't care. Yeah. Um, I don't, again, I, I, I don't know anybody specifically like that because I don't really read those books, but I, I, I want to keep it fresh for my own sanity and just for my self-respect. So if I have to write fewer books in the future, then I'll write fewer books in the future. I, I just don't want to, you know, start f cranking these out. Yeah. And that's not the worst thing, by the way, Mark, you're, no. you're in your mid fifties, right? So yeah. mm -hmm. you, yeah. first of all, you're, 
uh, you, you look younger than you are. You're a young man. You got plenty of ideas. There's there's plenty of ideas yet to come. But I like your uh, attitude, and I also yeah. like the idea that if hey, if you know, if all of a sudden I start dragging, there's nothing wrong. You know, there's a lot of people putting out two and three and four a year. Yeah. Um, I think uh, you know. So you so you drop back. I, all all it does is it forces us to go. Okay, I got to wait a little bit longer until another granny book comes out. So yeah, yeah, and uh, I mean. People be like, write faster, or you should have more books out. And I'm like, well, I'm the one that knows how bad it's going to be <laughs> if I'm like forced to write faster, or just like, you know, I've got 90 minutes to think up a plot, you know, or yeah. some, you know, turn twist in this chapter. Um, I don't really, I can't really work like that. So even though people say that, I mean, they say it because they like my work, and so it's a hundred percent a compliment. Um, I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm going to protect you from your idea <laughs> because I'll give you five books, but you're, they're not going to be, you know, what you want. You're not going to want book six. Um, yeah. so yeah, so I, I, I have to sort of keep my own counsel when it comes to that. Well, I like the fact that you used, uh, you used the phrase to the heart of the book, because there's a point about two thirds the way through. I want to call it chapter 55 for some reason it's stuck in my right. head. <laughs> if, if someone were to pick up the book. And I'm not ex suggesting, hey, Mark, I loved what you did on 55 because you're on your next book and you've already forgotten it. But mm -hmm. you might think it's a nearly a romance novel. And this is because we're talking about Koya. And, 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 and don't get, folks, don't get nervous. It's, it, it, mm -hmm. He's just writing the softer side of a story. But it does beg the question, and I don't think I've ever asked you this before. Do you think you're a romantic at heart? Because there's, it's such a solid, and of course you're married, but it's such a solid a uh, piece of love story that weaves in and out and it's not all tied up in perfect little unicorn bows. Yeah. Well, thanks for saying that. Um, I'll tell you what I think. I don't know if I'm a romantic at heart or anything like that, but <clears throat> both of the characters, Zoya and Court, um, <clears throat> they're in love, but for there's been a million things keeping them apart for six books or so. Um, that's why they call them thrillers. <laughs> sure. Um, the, uh, Zoya is... It, is a former Russian foreign intelligence officer, SVR, and now she's on the run from Russia. But she's in a very, very dark place in her life right now. I've had court in very, very dark places in his life in, in earlier books, and it's Zoya's turn. Yeah. But due to the war and her feelings about what her country's done, um, I, I'd make her as somebody who's not as maybe pure hearted as court is at the end of the day, but she's this is just a bridge too far. This is just beyond the pale. And she's abusing drugs and alcohol and she's uh, alone because she and court haven't seen each other in a year. And it's really taking a toll on her. So that creates like really high emotional stakes with that character court. Yeah. On the other hand, misses her, loves her. Um, he's just as upset about what's happening with Russia. And so he has these really deep emotional stakes as well. And so when the two of them finally do bump into each other, which, you know, I won't go into how that happens or the, the drama there. Right. It, it, I think it's very natural that two people are in this very pivotal point in their life and they do care about each other and they are now shoulder to shoulder or whatever that sparks fly the way that they would fly. Yeah. But it's not just, it's not just romance for, you know, like, you know, let's, let's go to the park and hold hands. It's, right. it's, it's more like they're, they're at desperate times in their life and they have to call on each other and their insecurities about the relationship and their insecurities about the other person's emotional stake, all those sort of things, you know, work their way into it. Meanwhile, there's an 88 page long action scene on a train, you know, yeah. while this is going on, you know, it's, it's not like this, this all happens at a coffee shop or anything like that. Um, you know, it's, it's within the context of, uh, you know, fast moving thriller, but all those things are interesting to me. So whether I'm romantic or not, I'm not really sure, but yeah. you know, just psychology is really interesting to me and interpersonal, you know, communications is, is very interesting to me. Well, I would say that the way that you look at your beautiful wife and the way that she looks at you and the way you guys photograph on Instagram, stalking, yes, included, <laughs> I would say that there's plenty of romance. Well, about. that's nice. Nice of you to say. Yeah. No, we, uh, most, most of those pictures are really accurate yeah. um, and, and not staged for the camera. No. And I appreciate <laughs> Well, the foodie, the foodie ones that I know that 
she yeah. likes to really yeah. geek That's out. That's her. That's yeah. not me. I just eat it. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> Honey, photograph it. But can you please move? Because I want to eat it. Yeah. Um, and just to switch gears just a tiny bit, I'm, I was, uh, again, reminiscing about Gray Man and seeing Ryan Gosling, who happens to be a bromance of mine. Uh, and I'm trying to imagine the rush of emotions that having a guy like him take on your universe. And I... And I got to ask, in those quiet moments, which are probably few and far between for you, Mark, because I've seen the the gaggle of kids and dogs at your Mm -hmm. house. But just between us, what what does all of this, and I I don't want to use the word instant recognition or instant fame, because it hasn't been instant. It's been a long, slow burner percolating on the back burner. But I mean, in those quiet moments when you're just like, yeah, this... This shit's really happening. Yeah, it. it um, I hate to use the word surreal because it, there's got to be a better way to say it. But it, it's funny and it's probably healthy that, like, we don't walk around talking about it very yeah. much in the house. Um, I, I always talk about. I, I'm always walking around whining about. Oh, I didn't get my words today, or there's no way I'm going to make my deadline. You know. So I had said we went to the uh, to the. Um, the premiere of the film in Hollywood last year. And I was joking with somebody months before that. I was like, just the way I am, the, the day of the premiere, I'm going to be whining about the fact I have to go to this stupid premiere because I've got to keep working. <laughs> and um, and then as it happened, I, it, I was in a hotel in West Hollywood and my wife was upstairs getting her hair made, you know, done. And yeah. I was down in the, I was down in the lobby till like 3.15 in the afternoon. We had to be there at five working on the book because I was on deadline. And, and so it kind of was that way. I mean, I was excited, obviously, to go and everything was sure. fine when I was there. But so, you know, m- my kids have seen the movie once because because I took them to it <laughs> when it came out. It's, it's so it's 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 all it, it doesn't come up that much. But I do. One of the things that's funny is like I will just sit there and go like, wait, I wrote seven Tom Clancy, Jack Ryan novels. And, you know, it's been like five, six years since I've, I've written one. And right. it almost feels like wait, there's no way I just, I did that. You know, it, it, my career still feels new to me, even though I've been an author full time for almost 14 years. Um, it, I still feel, you know, like a babe in the woods in, in a lot of ways. And I sit there and go like, wait, I accomplished that. I did, I did that Clancy thing. I don't think I could do it now, but I'm glad I did it <laughs> when I did it. And then the same thing with the film, you know, the film was always just this million to one shot that I never really took seriously other than to tell people about it because it's good promotion for your books. And then when it happened, um, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me and, and people talk about it now. And, and, um, you know, it was a year ago and I've written two books since then, or I'm, I'm on, on my second book since then. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it feels like it's a uh, water under the bridge a little bit, but it's always going to be there. And, you know, a 250 something million hours of downloads in the first 28 days, the fifth, Uh, biggest movie ever on Netflix. It's been really, really good for me. And they're doing another, which is really good for me. And um, so I, I recognize how lucky I am, but I really do feel like I'm locked into my work of next year's book. (laughs) It goes, it all goes back to, uh, you know, you've got to protect yourself from the noise because you've got to um, come up with something clever for next year. But see, this is one of the things I so admire about you, Mark, is the fact that your tenacity and your discipline to always perform is always there. I've I heard this from early conversations about you. Then I met you and I found it to be true. And I've heard you sit on panels and I've watched your, well, you've been on this show for now the third time. Yeah. And back to your comment, you're, you're down in the lobby. The wife's getting her hair done. You're in the lobby working on the next project because you know that's what it takes. And I think yeah. that's what differentiates you among yeah. many. And I'm not sitting here trying well, to blow you. heat up your skirt. I'm just trying to say that for the listeners who really want to make this a part of their life, they have to realize yeah. that it's it's work constantly. You got to yeah. always stay ahead of it. It's a lot of work. And then when you get one book out, you, you don't just sit there and talk about it on social media for five years. You know, you need Boy. to have the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. I will say that at the end of last year, my agent and my editor told me, don't worry about writing a second book this year. You've been burning the candle at both ends. I'd had a bunch of releases, the film and everything, everything else. They're like, take some time off. And usually take some time off means that I'm plotting my next book. Right. But I actually like worked hard not to work for a couple of months. I'd say like uh, October and November. 
of, of last year. Like I would get up and start to go into my office in the morning and I'm going like, Hey, I'm going to go, you know, clean one of my guns or, or just do something that has nothing to do with writing. And I was, you know, I had ideas in the back of my head that have turned into the book I'm working on now, but I'm like, I'm not even going to really start outlining it until the beginning of January or, or end of December or something. Yeah. So I, I, I did take some time off and it was, it was really beneficial. It felt really weird at first. You feel very useless <laughs> walking around this world going like, I don't even have a job right now, <laughs> but, um, you know, th this year I'll pay the price for it because this year I'm writing two novels and right. I have the big release and, and everything else. But, um, it was, it was healthy for me to do that. Well, I do. Uh, I want to ask you one question. We're going to take a little short break, but I want to ask you this first. Now, I'm wondering if you like Jack Carr, who made a surprise uh, perf uh, appearance in a Terminalist. Do you see yourself perhaps? Uh, have you thought about it? Likewise, in a future episode of The Gray Man, maybe in the next film that maybe you do you have any even a fantasy about doing a little cameo? I don't. I would love to to go to the set and just see the process, you know, just for a couple hours. Sure. I, th I mean, honestly, after a couple hours, I'd be like, all right, now I'm in the way. But I just, you know, kind of like to uh, to witness that personally. I've I've gotten to do some really cool things in my life because of being an author, where I'm just like, how am I getting to do this? I'm, you know, it's just so fascinating. So I would like to just do that, you know, just sit, stand by, behind and out of the way, and and watch for an hour or two. Um, but as far as being in a, a film, I. I'd probably stare at the camera the whole time and <laughs> wave. I mean, I, <laughs> I don't think I have any talent as an actor at all. <laughs> so, I, although, uh, yeah, Jack Carr's, uh, his scene was pretty short, yeah. but it was, it was, let's say, impactful without giving away anything. Um, I, I thought it was cool that, that he got to do that. But, yeah. Um, I, th I, I think I'm just too awkwardly self-aware to uh, <laughs> to not break the fourth wall, or is that what they call it? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. I like that though. It, it, it was short, but boy, has he has he uh, juiced every little bit of it having that scene on his social media? It's hilarious. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is his demise. You can watch it at any time. Exactly. All right, let's take one more short break. And when we come back uh, to our chapter three, we're going to discuss uh, more tools in Mark's toolbox. Stay with us. And now back to the show. And welcome back to the third and final chapter here on today's show. I am talking with Mark Rainey in the book, of course, we're talking about his burner. And we're talking about tools that Mark's, Mark uses in his uh, toolbox. Um, we were talking about um, references to research. And I, I have this one question. We, we were talking about this right before the break about appearing in a movie. And I find it interesting how so many... Uh, authors that you and I both know and we follow, they talk about their weapons a lot. I see them talking about, uh, they constantly flash their everyday carry on social media. And uh, I don't know that I've asked you this before. Are there things that you carry on a regular basis and are they necessary in sweet little Memphis? <laughs> yes and yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm pretty pro Second Amendment. Uh, Memphis, sadly, has incredibly awful crime right now, and Ooh. it's getting worse. And it's, um, I live in East Memphis, which has historically been one of the safer parts, but the, uh, the, the trouble is coming to our doorstep, sadly. Um, just about three weeks ago, there was an attempted abduction. Four guys um, tried to abduct, abduct a woman out for a jog about 2.15 in the afternoon on a Monday on the exact street that you know my wife walks on. Um, when she goes for her walks and stuff. And um, it, it's a horrific story about a, a young jogger at 4.30 in the morning here in Memphis, a school teacher from the school that you could almost throw a baseball to and hit from my house, um, was abducted and, and murdered. And this was, I guess, early September or October or something like that. Oh, my God. Um, 4.30 in the morning. You know, so, so these things are happening. And obviously Memphis is in the news right now because of the police brutality um, kill, killing, basically assassinating this young man for whatever reason that I'm sure we're going to find out about one of these days. Yeah. Um, but it was like a cold blooded murder right in, right in front of a police camera. And some of the guys had their dad, their, uh, badge cams on. So, um, they seem to have no concern whatsoever. So, you know, that, that's not going to help the crime situation in Memphis. If no. people don't tr trust the police even le less. In fact, they disbanded the, you know, the violent crimes unit that, that did this. And I'm like, I'm not sure the answer is, to, I mean, maybe the answer is to disband the unit because these five guys or seven guys or whatever it's up to now, you know, all were 
they, they, they just flat out killed somebody like it was El Salvador in the 1980s. And that happened in Memphis. And um, so anyway, I, I've, I've carried a gun since 2004, 2005. Uh, used to be a Glock 19. Now it's a six hour P365 XL and um, I train on it. And, you know, having a gun doesn't make you any safer, but, you know, passing the police, you know, pistol qualifications or even the federal SWAT, uh, you know, qualification course and stuff, which I've done, um, makes, makes it, makes you a little safer <laughs> than, than not having it. But it, it's a scary time in this city and I guess in America. Um, and, uh, you know, I feel like the cops are 15 minutes away and the bad guys aren't going to give you 15 minutes if, no. if something God forbid happens. I realized uh, in that moment that I might've appeared a little insensitive. I was using sweet Memphis is that I'm from the South. So I always yeah, think yeah. of the South as being, you know, well, I love, I love Memphis. You yeah. know, this is, this isn't a knock on the city. It's just a, a, a knock on what's going on now. There was an, a, another incident where uh, attempted carjacking in my neighborhood where uh, the guy shot, six shots at the at the car as it was trying to escape this was less than two weeks ago and it never made the news i saw the ring camera video because my wife knows somebody that knows somebody and um and then one of the one of the guys that was involved they put an ankle bracelet on him sent him home and he just uh got caught stealing a car and leading the police on a, a car chase yesterday or day before yesterday so i guess they put two ankle braces on him and sent him home now i don't know I don't know what they do. Maybe what he needs is an angle bracelet that attaches together and he sits in a little quiet room all by himself for a nice little stretch, if you know what that I'm saying. That makes sense to me. I think he's uh, 16 or something, so they're doing the whole, like, well, you know, you're, it's not your fault that you're involved in a shooting if you're that young. But it's really it's sad and scary. Yeah. Well, uh, just one last statement about that beating. That I, I, m There aren't words. There aren't words for that. I, I know. I know. It's... Um, looking at it and you know I, I don't know any real inside stuff i have friends who are cops um it, it looked very personal it looked very targeted yeah <laughs> it didn't look like you know obviously all the things that the police have, you know all the that these guys have said that the guy was doing there, there's no evidence of him doing any of those things so it, it it seemed like for personal reasons that this this happened the way it happened and sure hopefully that'll all come out um but it is is really it's just horrible well, to turn the car around a little bit and, and bring it back to a burner, I wanted to say, I wanted to give you this compliment. So maybe this will be a good way to lift the story back up again, not, not uh, disregarding any of that because our hearts are heavy because of that, but to talk about your book, the, one of the things I love about your book, Mark, and I think the, I uh, said this last time we chatted and I, it seems to have been, uh, it seems to be a trend that has shifted a little bit in your last few books and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's that heavy use. I use heavy in a good way, a uh, use of dialogue without getting too bogged down on all sorts of minutia, myopic detail, you choose to lean into what I call the art of conversation. And what I love about that is not only does it move the story forward often more swiftly, but it's so much more engaging because much like we were talking about the difference between books and movies is you really get the nuance of what's going on in their minds as they're talking. And this has to be a conscious decision that's kind of become part of your trademark, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and I don't even know if it's a conscious, conscious decision or if it's just something that I've found has worked for me and it just naturally happens more and more. I, I find the story in the dialogue a lot of times. Yeah. Uh, I find tension points that I didn't know were there. I have two people talking to each other about, you know, we need to, are we going to take a plane or are we going to take a boat? And there's some sort of tension in there that, that sort of relates to something else that I haven't even written, but it just sort of develops there. And I'm like, oh, okay, these people have a kind of a history or there could be some backstory here. So um, the other thing about dialogue is if it's done well, it's very visual uh, mm -hmm. to the reader. Um, and I, like I, if somebody pauses, if somebody sighs, if somebody, you know, chortles <laughs> or whatever, there's only so many ways you can do that. But I mean, <laughs> these little beats in the dialogue are like really important to me. I want, I want the reader to sort of experience the dialogue the way that I'm visualizing it. Yeah. And um, so if you do that well, and your characters are, you know, the right level of smart ass and smart and desperate or, or whatever, and that all comes out in the dialogue, I think it's really, really effective. I've had, um, 
you know, there, the people will tell me, they'll be like, oh, you're, you're, you're so clever. You're so clever for something that you wrote. And I always I kind of scratch my head and go, just so you know, I had six months to think up that line. Yeah. <laughs> that, that wasn't, that wasn't Mark Graney on the fly. That was, uh, that was my character, you know, and, and I probably, every time I read that line, I looked at it again and said, that doesn't really land the way I want it to. What's something more clever. And then yeah. after half a year, I've come up with something and people think that <laughs> every now and then somebody's like, oh, you're, you're so smart from your dialogue. And I'm like, yeah, I've been working on that forever. It's, it, it doesn't just happen naturally. It's like a comment I made to, um, Meg Gardner, mutual friend of ours, Meg Gardner mm -hmm. once, and we were talking, and I'm like, man, the way you crafted that sentence, Meg, was off the charts. I mean, the words and the, cr and the structure. David, you do know that I had like six months to write yeah. that scene. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, my two favorite books in the whole world, which I have borrowed since then, is the uh, dictionary and the thesaurus. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, I use my thesaurus on my uh, Microsoft Word all the time, and I'll be like, "Is there a better way to do this?" And, yeah. and I'll. And sometimes there isn't. Sometimes there is. Yeah. Here's something random because you mentioned this. What's the difference between chuckle and chortle? I I would only have a British person chortling. A a, a portly older British person would chortle. <laughs> I don't know. It, it, that's just how I see it. If you're asking Shortened. me, and, and, yeah, it's just, I don't think I would have, you know, like a 12 year old boy chortled, you know, right, when right. His, his buddy fell off a skateboard, you know, that would, that would feel kind of dissonant. Um, I don't think he'd chuckle either. Um, yeah, it, it's funny. You, I spent a lot of time trying to work on these words or, or going back and going like, all right, is this, is this getting a little adjective heavy here? Yeah. Or yeah. this is getting a little, you know, I'll, I'll read a, a, a paragraph and if I, they call them echoes. You know, if you have the same word too close together, uh, it's it's jarring. Yeah. And um, I've I've taught like a master class in New York at, at Thriller Fest, and um, everybody that I had like twelve students, and I read all their stuff, and it was all fantastic, and everybody's story was so different from each other, and all this other stuff, and all the problems I found with their writing were these really little mechanical things, which, which means they're super easy to correct once you're aware of it. It's just, you know, having written whatever number of book, uh, words I've written, like over 4 million words I've published, uh, <laughs> you sort of, you sort of figure out slowly, like, okay, this doesn't work and this doesn't work. And so I feel like I was, I was a good teacher in that, like, okay, I'm not going to give you any of this navel gazing stuff about story, but I'm going to say, Hey, this needs to be on its own paragraph. Cause this line is, impactful throw it on its own paragraph it looks cool people read read faster when they're short paragraphs and and that gives them the the sense of energy and excitement you know there's these these kind of like mechanical things you can do to clean stuff up get rid of echoes and you know yeah. just mind your point of view and in scenes and and all those things um yeah so I, I i do think about all that stuff a lot that's one of the, my favorite things another favorite thing about this book and you do that you you will throw out sentences at a time just one after the other and what i like about that and we've talked about this before is it just lends a speed to it and as you're yeah. so if you're reading faster you subconsciously feel like the energy's moving faster so yeah yeah you you come across a, a big dense paragraph and it slows you down a little bit yeah and if if there's a line in that paragraph that as a writer, you think, you know, this is the money shot here. This is what I want people to get out of it. Yeah. It's like, that's got to go on its own line. Don't, you know, I, I don't care what you learned in grammar in seventh grade or whatever. I was asleep, um, yeah. fortunately. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd probably do, be doing it too. Um, but yeah, so there, there's lots of uh, mechanical things you can do to make your, your writing better. And remember, my favorite, rules are made to be broken. Yeah, now, here's something I caught myself grinning at since we're on an upbeat mode, uh, and I love this. Luca paced the dining room, quoting here, circling the Ukrainians while Yacht Rock boomed through the house. Now, the reason I love that is because you got all these thugs coming into this uh, this uh, hidden house, right? They're all coming yeah. in. They're all stacking up. And the guy goes, can you turn down the uh, techno music? It drives me crazy. Heck, you can even put on, you know, easy listening music and play it loud and the surveillance won't be able to pick it up, which I thought was yeah. hilarious. Yeah. So then that line comes along Yacht Rock Radio, which for those listening to XM Sirius, uh, <laughs> you'll know what that's all about and uh, yeah i don't know why i did that just on the day that sounded just like something that just seemed like weird like you know it didn't matter 
to Luca yeah. what they were listening to. He just didn't like techno, and uh, yeah, they were trying to. Their laser surveillance equipment can yeah. uh, kind of be pointed at a window, and the vibrations it can pick up words from, and you you throw some music on there, and it doesn't happen. I bet techno would probably be better than you know Christopher Cross. Yeah, and, and the more I think about it, that didn't come from like the CIA. That just came from me. <laughs> On the day with a cup of coffee in one hand and a muffin in the other, trying to come up with something clever. Well, I think the extra reason it was so funny for me is, you know, I was on the radio for 25 years. And so five stations between Chicago and Detroit, we were playing back then what is now called Yacht Rock Radio. Yeah. And so easy listening or soft rock or love love songs at night, it's kind of thing. So it it was an extra funny one for me. And then I can't hear that phrase without hearing that silly DJ voice that were going, Yacht Rock Radio, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I hear, I hear some Michael McDonald or some Christopher Cross uh, right there. All right. I have one. We're going to start wrapping up here, sir. Uh, but I had this one whiplash moment. Tammy and I use this phrase, whiplash moment. We'll be talking about something. And then I'll just come out of nowhere. And she'll go, excuse me, that was whiplash. So where did that come from? Last time we, ch- one of the last times we chatted, and, and I got a point for this. You were setting up a handsome as hell gym in your house my question is has that epic gym gotten all the punishment that you had hoped it was going to when you set it up yeah i am so lazy in a lot of ways but as far as uh working out i've been really because i listen to podcasts mostly about the war in ukraine or Russian intelligence every day. Uh And I can't just sit in a room with my feet up listening to a podcast. So I work out every day. It's averaging about 25 times a month. So not every day, but pretty close to every day. And the the other benefit, I have a small gym, but it's right off of my bathroom. I can't go to the bathroom off my bedroom without walking past it. So right. there's that guilt factor. Yeah. And I spent the money to, to get a couple nice pieces of really good equipment, which is all you need. Yeah. And um, so then that adds the guilt factor too. Yeah. So I, I've really been good. And my 15 year old uh, stepdaughter, she'll she'll go on the treadmill, or my wife will go on the treadmill when she's not. You know, if, if there's too many murders in the neighborhood, she'll go on the treadmill for a few days. Um, and and uh, and so we do we do use it. And it's it's one thing that I'm really done. In fact, I'm going on my book tour next week and every hotel has got a gym that I'm going to. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not going to be doing podcasts all day and then a book signing at night and won't get to go to the gym. But, right. I, you know, like I, I did make sure that I, I'll be able to somewhat keep it up on the road and looking forward to that well and i applaud that and i you know when i saw you at the thriller fest and i went to slap you on the back i'm like it's a brick wall this guy is using that gym after all but the reason i bring that up is i think fitness and i've seen a big shift since i really started going back to the gym every single day or almost every day is that it really helps the writing not only are we counteracting all this hunched over yeah. energy that we're doing but the way it ignites the neurons and keeps you sharp and you know keeps also the belly a little bit flatter uh don't you agree that how how essential it is as part of our writing discipline Uh, absolutely it's benefited me a lot um i have more energy um you, you think that working out would make you tired and sometimes it does for like the first 15 minutes after a workout um but it but overall over the 24 hour period i have a lot more energy and like I said before, I I am my, my most creative. Well, usually I'm listening to podcasts when I'm writing. I mean, when I'm working out. Right. But like, if I take my dogs to the park and walk a couple miles at the park, that's I've come up with more of my ideas for more of my books uh, at the dog park than I have yeah. probably sitting at a laptop. <laughs> um, so so I think anything that you do, uh, you know, it's it's just that kind of me time thing, and and like working out is that I close the doors to the gym and the kids and the wife don't care that I'm in there. And, um, I can listen to podcasts and get totally engrossed in it, not even think about working out. I'm not some jock or anything like that. I'll just kind of do, do my thing. I try and do a little bit more every week or two. Um, but it's, it, it definitely benefits me in a lot of ways. Well, like the old saying goes, a body in motion stays in motion, right? Yeah. 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 And you, uh, you just wait, you just wait youngster when you get another decade on you. Um, You'll start feeling some of that. Uh, <laughs> I'm feeling all kinds of things. <laughs> it don't bounce back like it used to, baby. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, I know I have asked you this before, probably two other times because you've been on the show twice, but I always like to 
end the show with this question. You know it's coming, but and especially since I'm getting gaining, thankfully, so many new listeners each week, especially writers who want to hone their craft. So you know it's coming. Best piece of Mark Graney advice. Yeah, I know you got one. It's one of my favorites, but I'm going to ask you yet again. The, did, did I say finish something? Which yes. is one of the things. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'll just speak to that a little bit. Like I, I, I think the best thing you can do is, uh, let's say you're in the middle of a book or you're thinking about a book or whatever. It's just I don't care if it's the book or if you go into a short story or a novella or something. Write a beginning, a middle, and an end. Edit it. Get it perfect. Um, I don't care if it's twelve pages um, because there's so many different muscles necessary to to bring a project to completion. Um, it's not just writing the cool parts or coming up with this big sweeping plot. You have to do a thousand different things to get that thing done. And you sort of need, and if you write a 15 page short story, you will go through all, you know, the, the plot twists and the character development and the, you know, point of view changes and um, the editing and do it, are there echoes in here? Or is this, uh, you know, is my lead character, does he have an effect on the third act? You know, all these like little things, you, you can do that in, in a small space and then you know that you can do it and then it's better to go to the big place. I, and, I, and I say quantity can make quality. So the people that are just thinking about writing something and are trying to get it figured out before they put the first word on the page, it's like, I just want to grab those people by the collar and say, just write a page, go write another page, go write another page. Uh, you know, two weeks from now, you're going to be a vastly better writer than you were two weeks ago. And six months from now, you're going to be vastly better. And, uh, you know, a couple years from now, you could be published. And, and uh, I, I just think the, the daily grind of the process and completing something is, is the best thing you can do. So well said. And we don't know, Mark, I have run across so many people who have just sold novellas and they're mm -hmm. getting turned into more streaming material. You oh, can't yeah. you can't poo poo a novella anymore. No, absolutely not. Yeah. No, absolutely not. Anything you write is your intellectual property. And the way things are going with TV and streaming and all this other stuff, it's like you have your intellectual property. And if you can get interest from that, maybe somebody wants to turn that, wants you to turn that into long form fiction or an audio play like I did once, or, yeah. you know, they want to option it for a screenplay. There's all sorts of things you should do. It's like, just create stories. Create stories and don't put the parameters in your own mind. Just let the parameters do their own thing. Yeah. Yeah. Once again, the book is Burner. It's available for pre-order now. It's dropping next week, um, and it's a doozy. If you like Gray Man, if you like Mark Graney, you're going to love this one. I guarantee it. Bam. Mark, <laughs> as always. Uh, if folks need to learn more, they can go to your website, authorbice.com. Also built it. Uh, MarkGraneyBooks.com. Very muy importante. But... <laughs> Always good to see you, dude. I know you're you're stacked and packed and got all kinds of things, but thanks for taking time out for me. Oh, I always enjoy it, David. Let's do it again. All right. Always good to see Mark Graney. And this book, Burner, another gray man book, it is going to be killer. Woo, I see it on the big screen now. Anyway, thanks, Mark. Okay, now let's talk about next week. You know these two guys, one's called Andrews, one's called Wilson. They call Andrews Wilson, and the new book is Dempsey. By the way, these two cats, Brian and Jeffrey, two friends of mine, they have some huge news you probably heard about now. I'm not going to give it away in case you haven't heard it. Could it be about the Tier 1 Thriller series? Could be, maybe. Could be even bigger. So... Join us next week when Andrews Wilson is on the show. Until then, I'm David Temple, your host. I'll see you next time for another edition of The Thriller Zone. Hey, before I go, can I just say one quick thing? I want to say thank you to everyone who continues to write in their five-star reviews for our podcast. Sometimes I feel like the little train that could chugga, chugga, chugga. Other times I feel like a great big rock star. Either way, we are making it happen because of you. So thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. You can watch us on YouTube, you know. And just thank you for your kind comments and your support, both on Twitter, Instagram, and wherever you get your podcast. And if you haven't left a five-star review, don't let me stand in your way. I'd love to see you provide us with one. Okay. 
I'm really going now. See ya. Where's your mama, Papa?